Thank you everyone for attending our event. We are pleased to welcome Heather Hargraves, a trauma therapist and researcher in neuro and mental health practices. Currently, Heather is an advocate for the interface of neurofeedback modalities with psychedelic therapies, having an emphasis on the preparation and integration periods of psychedelic therapies once they're legalized. She is a recent scientist, or sorry, a resident scientist for Divergence, where her and the team conduct scientific research and development for some of the most cutting edge applications combining neuroscience, psychedelic therapy, neurofeedback practices to address addiction, depression, and other mental health issues. The use of neurofeedback allows for monitoring live data from an individual's brain waves. This can teach the individual how to self-regulate, train themselves to maintain a healthy brain state, and bring their body's internal functioning into their own awareness. Essentially, it can help to control or at least better navigate um, their own embodiment in the world. It's used by athletes and doctors to treat patients with stroke, ADHD, addiction, depression, and more. Her research investigates the neurological underpinnings of various states of consciousness, including dissociation, meditation, psychedelics, and various polyphagic states of consciousness associ associated with shamanic practices. NRG is tremendously pleased to welcome Heather Hargraves for the special talk on nurturing awareness with psychedelics and neurofeedback. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. And before we started, we were talking about how right now is a really exciting time too, because I'm just launching a really cool study looking at biomarkers for DMT in various psychedelic states to help us better understand, you know, how do we treat those with addiction and how do we treat those with various mental health challenges using these medicines in a way where we can add technology to increase our assessment and clinical skill. So that's what I will be talking to you guys about today. I will open up my slides. So thank you, Ali, for the introduction. So I don't need to do that for myself. My pleasure. <laughs> so today we're going to go on a journey into self. And that journey that we're going to take is through relational technology. And this quote I'm going to share with you at the start, I'm just going to sit with it for a moment because I feel it really encapsulates and sets the tone for the overall message I'm trying to share. So there will come a time when a disease condition will not be described as it is today by the physicians and psychologists but it will be spoken of in musical terms as one would speak of a piano that is out of tune. So through relational technology, here's some images of myself and some friends. Um, I find that neurofeedback actually has the potential to really fit the bill for relational technology. And I'm encouraging we shift our use with technology because I'm sure many of you are aware of the documentary that came out called The Social Dilemma and my experience personally with social media and colleagues and friends and clients, it's been built to be addictive. It's been built to capture one of your greatest resources, which is your attention and your intention. And the way we use where we put our mind and where we put you know, the effort of our soul in a sense changes the way that your neurology, your neurophysiology, your networks in the brain, it changes the ways that they fire, it changes the ways they connect, and it changes, more importantly, how you relate to others and how you relate to yourself. So my goal is to develop technology that helps us become more reflective and in tune with our inner awareness and our relationship with our nervous system. So one way to kind of explain neurofeedback is especially along this idea of it being a musical relational tool is to look at it as a choir. So slower brain waves basically are the lower notes when you're thinking about a choir. Faster brain waves are the higher notes within the choir. Alpha in and of itself is more like that bonding rhythmic middle tone 
or like the drummer, the rhythm section in a band. And when these guys are singing together, we get harmony. Now, one way of looking at gamma in and of itself, which is a, it's a really cool brainwave, is to look at it as reflective of moments of harmony in the brain. So, you know, when you're hearing a song and that music gives you chills, in some ways, gamma could be reflective of that like chill state, like the music has really hit some sort of note in you or some sort of insight or understanding, and then we see gamma reflected. But how do we help acquire learn harmony? Well, often there's a conductor and the conductor offers feedback. So relational technology using EEG methodology where we put sensors on the head and record, record brainwave activity, that information can then be fed back to the client or the individual using the relational technology by offering feedback on how harmonious the choir is. Oops. So sometimes what you will find in certain parts of the brain is that we want to see the choir sing a little bit louder or a little bit higher. And in that case, I would be rewarding the person as if they were doing a high jump. So whenever their brain waves go over a specific frequency or level that I have set using something we call thresholding, where I can move these bars up and down based on what I want the individual to do, they will get a reward. And that reward is often done through visual feedback, auditory feedback, or haptic, which is a vibration feedback. If I want the brain and that individual to quiet a specific brain state, then they're going to get the reward more when they are under the bar, so it's like a limbo bar. And again, the same reward paradigm applies. I'm gonna move my like looking at people more to the center. <laughs> I feel looking off to the corner. All right, but brain waves are indicative of something. So why or what does it mean for each brain wave to be present in the brain? And what is the story or the narrative that brain waves are telling us? And one way to really understand this is to think of brain waves from a developmental perspective. Different aspects of the nervous system are kind of like little Russian nesting dolls, and they are developed at different trajectories as we age. So Delta, for example, is developed early in life. It's the brainstem. It's our first fight, flight, freeze response. So a baby really doesn't have a sense of self yet. A baby only has what we call their orienting response. So if a baby likes something, then they turn their head and their gaze and they sometimes smile or they lean into and kind of relax to the stimuli. If the baby is unhappy, then they tend to look away, turn their head, turn their eyes, and then they tense. So that early nervous system response of relaxing and tensing is set early on. And it's kind of like a seed state in the brain. And that has a lot to do with both the temperament that you're born with from genetics based on your ancestral past, but also the environment in which you are existing in. So if a baby is born in an environment that's very stressful, they're likely to develop more of a core, deep sense of self that's avoidant, tense, and overwhelmed. But if the baby is a nice, supportive environment, then they're more likely to be calmer and more open and they orient more easily to the world around them. Then as the child develops, they move into this emotional awareness. And this is our limbic system. And the limbic system rides on top of the brainstem. This is when we start getting a sense of who we are, asking for what we need, feeling different things and engaging with the world around us. And this has a lot to do with our memory centers, our embodied awareness, our relational um, aspects to self and other. And then right around the age of 10 is when these first three nesting dolls are kind of set, which builds basically the core of our subconscious and embodied awareness and kind of how our temperamental drives have been groomed based on the environmental impact that therefore we develop an adaptive strategy to our environment. And that adaptive strategy sets that tone or that rhythmic overlay for the greater harmony, which comes from the alpha frequency. Now you can see on the right that alpha is this bridge between the subconscious and the conscious mind. And that's because alpha is tied to the thalamus. 
the thalamus is the relay station, kind of like grand central station for information coming from the body and going up to the cortex and from the cortex back down. It is also tied to these things we call thalamic cortical loops, which go up into the cortex and it's another like highway station of how information is gated through the nervous system. Then as beta comes online, this is our prefrontal cortex kind of maturing and developing and beta tends to be mostly focused from cortical activation. Whereas if we're seeing delta and theta, we know it's coming from deeper in the nervous system. So beta frequencies are tied to the development of the prefrontal cortex, which really we had this another developmental burst around the age of 21. And when I was working with undergraduate students uh, at the university as a young counselor, um, I noticed that this is a period of a lot of confusion and sometimes overwhelm. And we don't do a really good job of telling people that this is a massive developmental stage. And sometimes when the brain is developing, because it's allocating resources to this new level of development, there's a bit of a regression that can happen. And this development of metacognition. So suddenly you have this ability to think about thinking and where am I going and where am I going in the past? And now these thalamic cortical loops all the way down into Delta are really starting to form. So suddenly you become aware of these deeper nesting dolls, deeper aspects of self. And then again, gamma is that indication of like, you know, when the rhythm and the harmony is in full swing, we'll see more gamma in the brain. So for my undergraduate thesis, um, it was the first time I was really introduced to this idea of states versus traits. And why this matters is because brain waves are indicative of different states. And understanding for me that actually it's our states that dictate traits, not traits that dictate states was kind of like a Copernican shift in how I was thinking about things. Because many models in psychology right now are based on self-report measures. Um, we have the DSM, we have diagnostic criteria, and these are all based on behaviors and traits, but not necessarily looking at, looking at what are the underlying states that lay, led to the development of those traits. So my uh, undergrad research looked at even though we had nine different scales of mindfulness or trait mindfulness, when were people actually in the state that would lead to the outcome of that trait? And the three core traits that kind of underlie the majority of mindful findings or mindfulness trait measures are openness, acceptance, and curiosity. So coming back to the brain again, an individual who is in relationship with their nervous system, who is having these experiences of gamma, experiences of flow. And like a lot of people like to talk about flow being this transcendent or higher place, but the truth is, it's actually when you are deeply rooted in who you are, when you have really deepened your relationship with who you are, when you understand each of the aspects of self, and there's a compassion and a relationship there that we're more likely to see gamma. So you can't technically transcend yourself without deeply knowing yourself, which is, you know, in many of the communities, the idea of shadow work that needs to be done. Um, this is an image that I often use for clients to help them understand what I mean about having a relationship with your nervous system. And I try to move away from this idea of good, bad, right, wrong in therapy, uh, even in my own personal language. In general, things are pleasant or unpleasant, but why? So when somebody is in relationship with their nervous system, a nervous system that activates and gets into the high notes feels pleasant. A nervous system that deactivates and goes into the low notes also feels pleasant. But if you are not in relationship with your nervous system, often you instead you are gonna feel unpleasant feelings. Now, of course, unpleasant and pleasant should have adaptive responses. In general, we should, when we are coming against something that doesn't feel good, we want those unpleasant feelings. They're meant to inform us. But if those unpleasant feelings are persistent, no matter what's happening in your life, then it's more likely to do with some sort of deeper relational situation or the situation outside of yourself is actually unpleasant 
And in some ways I've kind of said that we've been hypnotized into pathologizing healthy responses to an unhealthy system. So some individuals, you know, the distress that we're feeling is coming from the strife in the world. It's coming from the systems in which we live in. And it's learning how to validate our nervous system and understand that the nervous system is sending valid messages is kind of one of the key pieces that we're trying to tease out when we're using relational technology so that you can become more clear on actions you need to take, whether they be internal or external. Um, one individual's work that I really uh, enjoy and I recommend if anyone is struggling with trauma in any way, shape or form, her book is really well written and it's healing the fragmented selves of trauma survivors, which is really what I'm often trying to do with relational technology. You don't necessarily have to have trauma, but various challenges are related to relational processes. And she says, in contrast to 25 years ago, trauma treatment today focuses survivors not on the pain, but on accessing the kind of feelings they would have experienced if they'd never been traumatized. And really trauma was still defined as an event outside the, was not, or was still defined as an event outside the range of normal human uh, interaction before 1989. So one of the easiest ways I think of most people entering into the field of neurofeedback and understanding these theories of um, relational technology is through this lens of neuromeditation which we can kind of conceptualize as attention and intention therapy, because it ties into these core attentional practices that have these long history across a variety of uh, traditions, religions, across cultures, because we all share the same nervous system. And as the neuroscientific literature has been, you know, culminating in the last few years on meditation practices, we've come to see that there seems to be four key types that underlie a, the majority of different practices. And the easiest way to understand them is to imagine yourself in a garden. So with a focus meditation, we are looking at one flower in the garden and you would keep bringing your attention back to that one flower. And this is helpful for individuals who have distractible minds, for example. Mindfulness is being in the whole garden. So sitting in the garden, but not focusing on any one thing, but also not moving away from the garden itself. So you've kind of surrendered in a way to a state of allowing in which the garden is just, you know, drawing your attention in different waves of awareness. Quiet mind meditation is the garden at night. So this is what most individuals kind of perceive as the peak meditative practice, this quiet state, the samadhi state where everything kind of drops out. It's, it's heavily tied to transcendental and Zen meditations. And in this one, we know we're in the garden, but we experience periods of silence and in some ways, some periods of awe. Then loving kindness meditation is actually quite advanced because it rests on the kind of architecture that focus mindfulness and quiet mind offer us. And in loving kindness, we're kind of allowing the fragrance of the flowers or the feeling of being in the garden or the beauty we feel from that moment to be the dominant felt sense. And we've kind of dropped cognition completely. And now we are allowing ourselves to be deeply rooted and embodied in a way that's nourishing and warm. So this image comes from a meditation paper looking at the stages that the brain goes through during a focused meditation. And I thought this image is really useful because I use it to try to tie in some of the th desperate theories that I'm pulling together here. So now what you're seeing is actually, these are the brain regions that are tied to these different meditative practices so in a focus meditation, we're kind of down here, sustaining attention. We're in the front kind of dorsal lateral aspect of the prefrontal cortex. Then when the mind wanders, we move into the back of the head where we go into something called the default mode network. So these two networks are seen as task positive 
I'm active, I'm engaged, I'm cognitive, and task negative or a default state in which you're idling and your self-referential processes of who you are and your identity are kind of activated. But then during that meditation, wait, I had a goal. So then I recognized, oh, I was not on my goal. And that's like an embodied awareness. This is our salience network comes online and we say, oh, I need to come back to what I was focusing on. Then there's a moment of self back here, which is tied to the DMN, self-awareness or self-referencing, kind of guiding yourselves back. And then you kind of drop the self again and focus on the meditation at PAND. So what I started noticing is that these three types of meditations, which over here in the right, Shenzhen Young kind of says there's this triangle of meditative awareness that involves concentration power, which is central executive network, sensory clarity, oh, I'm noticing, or I'm mindful, or I'm feeling, or I'm in a loving state, which is tied to our salience network. And then equanimity, which is I'm noticing myself, how do I feel about myself, which is tied to our sense of self. So I use the metaphor of somebody riding a bike to try to really expand upon what does it mean to use meditative practice as a means of kind of doing physiotherapy for the networks in your brain, which are then reflected in that overall harmony of the brain waves and the way they're appearing on the cortex that we're reading with EEG. So when we are training focus meditations, we're really trying to train our concentration power or our curiosity. Disorders of the front of the brain have a lot to do with either hyper-focus, OCD, anxiety, or hypo-focus, or kind of like a depressed, avoidant, dissociative, or ADHD state. So we, we need to be able to kind of narrow that in and open it up. While focus meditation narrows it in, mindfulness meditation opens it up. So you start learning to be in relationship with that aspect of the bike, which is your handlebars. So where are you going with your bike? That's your prefrontal cortex. Then the default mode network, as I was explaining before, you know, delta, theta, alpha, the, the core of who you are in that alpha rhythm, which is this balance of the bike, how pumped up are the tires? Do you got the right bike for where you're going and what you're doing? That bike gets updated throughout your childhood based on the relationships you have with caregivers and your environment. But the bike is also somewhat defined by, you know, the genetics and who you are. Some of us get a little more of a speed bike. Some of us get a little more of a cruiser bike. That's cool. One's not better than the other. You just need to know what kind of bike you have and have you been tending to your bike well. And then that's more with equanimity or acceptance, you know, that ability to allow what you have and to develop enough equanimity to relate to it and to adjust it and to pump up the tires when it's not feeling quite right. And then the salience network is actually, actually the mediator of the handlebars and the bike itself. And the handlebars and the bike itself or the task positive and the task not negative networks are what we call anti-correlated. So you're either in your head doing stuff or you're in your head ruminating and you switch them all day, super fast. When somebody is not clinical, they're spending 70% of their time focused on where they're going and 30% of the time focused on like how they got there, what's coming next, can my bike handle this? Clinical populations are the opposite. We're spending all this time worried about the bike. You know, is my chain right? Is it oiled? Can I get there? And then we're holding on so tight that we're really not directing where we're going or we hit a bump because we weren't paying attention. So this is where having an attuned salience network, which is this mediator between the two, it's that relational self and being open to our experience helps us recognize what's going on with the bike. Do we even know we're on a bike and what's our relationship with the bike? So we not only need to be focused on you know, thoughts, but we need to be focused on feelings because feelings and these inner states are what dictate how we ride our bike. So state education or neuro meditation training is really an education in allowing or surrender. 
So again, we have focus, mindfulness, quiet mind, open heart. And now we can kind of see how the brain waves tie in. Control of attention, narrowing. Mindfulness of observing, opening. Quiet mind is really that spacious awareness, but it's really that relationship with the bike. It allows us to have more of a surrendered, engaged relationship. And also alpha is that rhythm that keeps everything connected both into the cortex and deep into ourselves. Then open heart, there's a gamma tone to it. So open heart, when we are in relationship with ourselves, we're more likely to have more flow, more allowing, more surrendering and show more gamma in the brain. And so again, you can kind of see that focus would be tied to ADHD because it activates the system to focus. Mindfulness is good for stress and anxiety or OCD presentation. It's calming on the nervous system, calming on the prefrontal cortex. When we have a personality disorder, trauma, some sort of disrupted sense of self, self being that rhythmic tone, we want to focus more into like DMN trainings, quiet mind. And then open heart is depression, relationship issues, which is really asking us to do a deeper assessment of our relationship across these attentional frequencies. Now, my, re my thesis work actually for my master's was to look at dissociative states and from the dissociative states, we are finding that we are really struggling to get individuals who are in dissociation into the room therapeutically to be able to engage their prefrontal cortex to do traditional talk therapy. And this was heavily tied to a disrupted sense of self. So we were looking a lot at alpha frequencies in the brain and they had developed a specific neuro meditation or a neurofeedback protocol that was targeting alpha specifically However, when research came out showing that psychedelics not only target, targeted alpha, but more of a broad band from one to 20 hertz of quieting in the nervous system, we decided to see, well, what happens if we use neurofeedback to reward the brain for quieting those regions using a feedback device? And that was basically my master's thesis work. And my thesis work basically showed that we, our findings were not unlike those of psilocybin or MDMA for experiences of unity, blissful state, insightfulness, experiences of disembodiment, anxiety, and audiovisual uh, synesthesia. And this was because we gave the OVA or OVE, the altered states of consciousness rating scale, or OAV <laughs> of consciousness rating scale. And we kind of mimicked my. Um, thesis research to align with the psychedelic literature of the time. I also emailed my participants following um, the neurofeedback protocol, which was about 15 minutes. And we noticed that the feedback seemed to align with what we see with microdosing. It also seemed to align with what we see following psychedelic experiences. So people reported an elevation in mood, improved focus, calm, they felt more relaxed and tranquil. They had vivid dreams and their senses were increased, an altered sense of time, and some clients had spontaneous processing during the experience. Recently, a publication came out that's predicting reactions to psychedelic drugs, a systematic review of states and traits related to acute drug effects. I was very excited about this, and I'm not sure if you guys can see why I was so excited about this, but look, they show that having a mystical experience and long-term outcomes are tied to people who have higher absorption, openness, and acceptance, which leads to this increased state of surrender. And those who enter a psychedelic experience with preoccupation, apprehension, and confusion are less likely to have a positive outcome. So let's come back to this slide. When I was in a conference uh, earlier this year, I got an opportunity to speak to Shinzen Young, and he is a Buddhist scholar. He's written really amazing books. I highly recommend checking out his meditations. He's doing some really wonderful work. And he said to me, what's the difference between oops, the fire that burns and the fire that warms? And that really got me thinking, because what is the difference? Well, the difference is your relationship to your nervous system. And that difference is tied to how open, how you know, focused or absorbed, how accepting 
and how much surrender, which in some ways we can see with that gamma, that harmonic experience you have with your nervous system, do you have in your nervous system before you go into one of these psychedelic experiences or what brought you into therapy is usually unpleasant feelings that persist no matter the context and you just can't seem to figure it out. And I find that when I'm working with my clients through these methodologies, we start just paying attention to how is your nervous system or your response to your nervous system that you are defining as anxiety and depression protective? How is that helping you? How has it helped you? And how does staying in that state, you know, help you maybe not feel some of the feelings that caregivers or different experiences were not able to validate? And then we work through a process through various intentions and attention using neuromodulation to rebuild that experience or rebuild that relationship with the nervous system, which then usually calms the nervous system because the message is telling you something. And once you understand the message, the system can go back to functioning. And of course, that's not to say that there's not genetic uh, ties to this. I understand that many people, there are heritable things that at times we need to bring medications on board for. You know, brains can have experiences where things are missing and or impeded, which could be a lot like, you know, somebody whose body needs a wheelchair, but let's know what that is and find the variety of therapeutic, medical, psychedelic, whatever it may be, technique that meets you where you're at to validate you and not continue to make you feel like something is wrong with you. So from here, it kind of brought us to a place where we met um, Intheon Biomedical. And when I say we, I talk about a company that I am a part of called Divergence Neuro. And Divergence Neuro is a new software company that is focused on trying to bring neurofeedback technology to the public through clinicians in a way that's mobile, based on a cloud, easy to access, easy to use at a distance. And we thought that during the pandemic, this might actually be a useful time to do this. And Entheon Biomedical kind of approached us because they were looking for someone that wanted or a company that could help them figure out how to use technology to support psychedelic experiences. And as we've been talking, we actually realized that what we wanted to do is develop a biomarker model to help understand and predict which individuals are more likely to have a positive or pleasant experience with psychedelics and when perhaps somebody should hold off and may need some more therapeutic state attention intention training before they enter into the psychedelic experience. So one thing that we're actually looking at is EEG phenotypes. So phenotypes are an intermediate step between genetics and behavior. There's about 12, 11, 12 of them and they have been shown to have genetic links. Um, they are often used right now to predict an individual's response to therapy for neurofeedback as well as for medication. So I was proposing, well, why couldn't we be using these for psychedelic therapies? And the States and Traits paper also highlighted the need for us to start assessing and quantifying and understanding where someone's starting point is as we enter into the psychedelic renaissance and more and more people are seeking to use psychedelics and more and more clinics are potentially popping up. Can we not offer some sort of software platform using neuro and biofeedback technologies to support clinical assessment, to support these current measures that we have right now of understanding states or understanding traits by offering a phenotypical state measure of somebody's beginning point, measuring them during the psychedelic experience and also measuring them after the psychedelic experience. So that just brings us to this question of, you know, can we use neurofeedback to attune our embodied awareness, therefore highlighting cultivating a deeper harmonic relationship with aspects and states of self-awareness that are more likely to put us into this flow or allowing surrendered state that leads to these positive outcomes. And why this matters is because we're finding more and more that, you know, psychedelics seem to bring out this hyperplastic state aiding rapid and deep learning that can mediate psychological transformation. 
and the rebus model talks about how it you know if the landscape of the mine is flattened we can start freely transitioning between states we have this increased connectivity in various networks of the brain so the model that we're kind of building or the platform that we're building is the idea of using neurofeedback as a playground of self-awareness and a way to allow us to use relational technology to more finely tune and work with these freed up um, networks. And while we kind of have cleared the stage, well, what's the intention and where do you want to go and how can you use a technology to support you along the way? And eventually the goal is once you learn that skill, you could go off and do it without the technology. But at times it's always helpful to have a mirror to look in once in a while, just to check and see, you know, if you got anything on your face. So Carl Rogers is an inspiration. I really like him as a clinician. And I, I think that this comment really highlights why relational technology can be supportive because it's not about treating or curing or really changing a person. It's more about how do I provide a relationship where this person can use for their own personal growth? And my experience with the technology is it sometimes offers this mediation between me and the client that's very objective. Because if a client has a history of attachment wounds or stresses through relationship, it can take time to build that trust. But when we have this technology that's in the middle and offering this, this really objective metric of like, how are you doing? It can also help challenge the adaptation of where they are. So one thing I experience with clients is something called relaxation induced anxiety. So I'll hook someone up, their betas are shrill, they're anxious, they're really, really high, but they've habituated to that. They're super used to it. And I can talk to them until I'm blue in the face, but like that really doesn't change much. Or even if they do calm down, they may not get the feedback that that's happened or they attribute it to being in the office with me, but how do they take that out of the office? But if in that moment I'm getting to do, uh, like we do some somatic work, specific mind activation techniques or breathing activation or deactivation techniques, and they see the metric on the computer going down or they're getting feedback that they're shifting, then I can say, ah, now you're in a place where your nervous system is actually using energy in a more conservative way. They may feel kind of calm, but that calm could actually be a little bit uncomfortable. So we talk about that like emotional cardio that as you're training, some discomfort is expected. So it's helpful to have metrics that are still validating that even though it's kind of uncomfortable, you're still going in the quote unquote right direction or going into a more pleasant direction or a direction that will become more pleasant over time with repeated um, experience. So going forward, kind of what we're doing with Entheon and the Divergence platform is that we went through the decade of the brain, we went through the decade of discovery, and now we're kind of into this decade of translation where we use neuro or biomarkers for personalized care and the prevention of disease. So for um, the Entheon project, we are looking at AI and machine learning predictive biomarker modeling. Uh, to help predict treatment response and validate that through the software platform. And particularly for Entheon, we're looking at novel treatment for addiction using DMT as an infusion. Um, and then we look at Chris Timmerman's work here where we see that you know alpha suppression is typically one of the things that we see as tied to the psychedelic state. They also have something else called the limple Z complexity, which shows when the brain has entered a specific amount of complexity, that's also again tied to those positive outcomes. So in essence, you know, those priors have been released. We're seeing more gamma. And then maybe that rhythm section in the middle with alpha is getting a chance to reset. We're resetting that rhythm, re resetting that relationship with deeper states. And that's what opens up the potential for a pivotal mental state or this relaxation of previous uh, beliefs. So how does it all play together? Um, so what we're hoping our platform will offer is that as we gather these biomarkers, we're kind of looking at that as a special sauce. The actual divergence software platform is going to be the kitchen where people can go and cook Therapists who are trained in using the kitchen will be the chefs, um, headset or the cooks, and then headsets we kind of see as utensils. So we're a software platform. We are not a hardware platform. We will play with any hardware that will play with us. 
and I'll show you in a moment some of the headsets we're working with. We're also going to be bringing like biometrics on from various Fitbit, Fitbit devices and Apple watches. And so the idea is you can kind of like Frankenstein together your own biometric assessment as you would like. In the beginning, this will all be guided through clinicians because these are clinical tools. Um, and our hope is to open up the field of connection to these teachers and these lineages, which are the chefs. And the chefs are hopefully going to oversee and guide how these cooks use these utensils and how we use the kitchen. And then from there, different applications will be built, which we call neurofeedback protocols, that individuals using the platform can have access to and learn how to apply to themselves. Here's a little example of our mobile and web app. I'm really grateful to my Divergence team for all the hard work they're doing. I could never have dreamed any of this would come uh, with my own capacity. So I'm, I'm really grateful to our CEO who has kind of spearheaded uh, the development of research and um, I'm losing my words, but basically making this whole back end possible in development of the app. Uh, here's a picture of our two headsets that we're going to be launching with this spring. So we've got the Neurosity Crown on the left and the Newfini device on the right. And again, different utensils will allow you to cook different things. So we're hoping that in time, the platform also drives innovation in the development of these headsets because where you put the sensors actually kind of dictates what kind of training you can do and helping people understand which utensil is right for their brain is something that we're hoping we can kind of figure out. So as a final thought, until you make the unconscious conscious, you will direct your life and you will call it fate. So my goal and my hope is that as we move forward, uh, we're moving into a time where we can start applying these neuroscientific understandings and deepening our relationships with our nervous systems and moving away from models that are pathologizing and instead models that are more harmonic and help us learn how to enter into relationship that brings about a state of harmony with ourselves and those around us. So thanks guys. Uh, Ram Das just saying we're all just walking each other home in the end. You can contact me through any of these links. Wow. So thank you so much for all of that information. It's so <laughs> explorative and, and cutting edge and just expansive in so many ways. Um, <laughs> Now I want to open up the floor to anyone who has any questions for Heather. If you can unmute yourself, if you want to speak or if you want to type it in the chat, you're more than welcome to do either or. Happy to chat guys. Anything that's sitting there. Yeah, Jim. Hi, Heather. <clears throat> Hi, Alex. <laughs> um, so I'm a, a psychedelic therapist. Mm -hmm. I sit for clients in the underground mm -hmm. um, doing therapy and, you know, it's beautiful and um, so, so valuable and important to people. How do I play with you guys? How do you play with us? So you can email us and we can start chatting. So, but, but would it be like I, I get the app, I get a device, I yes. yeah. get my clients to try that yep. out and help them. Yep. And I can take training through your company and we are building out the training right now. So um, the Mind Foundation in Berlin is launching an augmented psychotherapy training in November. And it will be the first one to bring the neuro meditation and neurofeedback methodology into the training. So Yes, uh, through the Neuromeditation Institute is probably where you would start because our first applications will be um, mostly neuromeditation based and that should be available more to the public with or without clinical support, probably in the beginning with clinical support and then eventually learning how to use it on your own and how to apply it to your clients. So I would say starting there, yeah. Okay, okay, I'll keep an eye on it. Thank you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Okay, so we have a question from Kelly. Uh, Hi, Heather, what process will you be using to train therapists with the new platform? So that is still, we are, you guys are, are catching us at the, the crest of our wave, I would say. 
Um, so through the Neuromeditation Institute, as I just mentioned, and then alternatively, I'm working with the Mind Foundation to try to develop something quite substantial for those interested in augmented psychotherapy going forward and applying these tools in that area. All right. Um, we have another question from Claudia. Can you explain more of the audio visual measures in the neurofeedback study? Yeah. Oh, so in the actual neurofeedback study, um, we used a game called formation and formation is basically, and then we use static images that were psychedelic in nature that are on the screen and then it's covered in boxes. And as the individual enters into the state, so that it's, it's a squash, which was a quieting of all of those brain frequencies to mimic what's going on in psychedelics, the picture started to unfold. Um, I've since, as I went through the research, I started adapting it. So now my clients will watch either Mandela's, like a moving Mandela, or something like Northern Lights. Some clients watch fish. It depends on what feels good for their nervous system. And we have a screen overlay. And I like this one a little more because it's, it's flickery. Um, and so I find it a little bit more discreet. And every time your mind wanders, the screen starts to go foggy. And every time you kind of quiet the ego and get out of that ego state and get into more of like a felt momentary state, the screen clears. So that's been really productive for teaching my clients. And that's kind of where I recognized how it was teaching acceptance and equanimity because I just stopped noticing more and more people just be very balanced after uh, these experiences. Awesome. And then I guess someone said that Carrie, you had a question. Okay. She's got to unmute. There. Okay. There we go. Um, hi, Heather. It was hi. really great listening to you talk. Um, so I come from like a science background. So I did life science at Queens, and there wasn't really much room or time for you know like exploring <laughs> these like more, um, I guess, like arts-based ideas and like schools of thought. <clears throat> but over the past several years, like I've definitely had more time to, I guess, broaden my horizon. And I was really fascinated when you were talking about shamanism and how, I guess, you kind of accumulated all these different practices from different cultures um, and different periods. Yeah, like what was that like for you and how did you kind of like make that connection with mental health and like these ways? So I would say that a lot of that relies on the mentoring and guidance of Dr. Michael Winkleman. So he's got a book called The Biopsychosocial Paradigm of Shamanism. And that man knows more about this kind of network of how shamans you know, what's, like, what's it like when they enter into specific states? And because he's an anthropologist, he looked across all these different cultures. And I met him really serendipitously at a conference. And then he kind of mm -hmm. just took me under his wing and I've helped him edit some of his works and just kind of followed along with him. And then we just got into this really nice mentor kind of ship experience of just discussing this stuff and recognizing yeah. some of the overlaps. So as I come to things, he validates them for me and then I kind of grow out the literature while we're sharing different research uh, papers. That's really cool. Yeah, so like, I think I was lucky to, I guess one of the very eye-opening experiences I had was taking um, <clears throat> medical anthropology in Shanghai. Yeah. And like, we saw all the European influences in their like Catholic churches and also like, I guess like Catholic hospitals, but we also went to like more local clinics that use a lot of TCM practices. Mm -hmm. And they talked about the Wusin theory. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, how is this related to this organ? Like it's made out of hepatocytes, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, it was just like, it was just a really great experience to I guess see how it's with embedded within their culture. And I feel like we kind of lack that here. Oh, 100%. And it's something I didn't talk about in, in this talk, but the idea of like monophasic versus polyphasic perception. Uh, there's this anthropologist Lumpkin, I forget her first name, but her paper, it's a really great paper. It's called Perceptual Diversity. And mm -hmm. 
she's talking about, you know, the future of the globe and how traditional cultures were really heavily rooted in polyphasic perception, which is perception that is not just using cognition and science, but also using rhythm and dance and laughter and music. And two other individuals who are kind of carrying that forward as uh, Joe Trafour, and he's got the Fellowship of the River uh, program, and he's doing epigenetic research into seeing if following psychedelic experiences, do we see epigenetic change? And then mm -hmm. the other individual is Dr. Uh, Yellow, Dr. Michael Yellowbird, who's actually got this theory of neurodecolonization and that our minds have been colonized and through many, many generations of thinking certain ways, it's actually mm -hmm. affected our relationship with our nervous system. And we see this increase in alexithymia in many different mental health disorders, which is really a numbing of our limbic system or our felt sense. And if you grow up in a culture where felt sense isn't nurtured, then those networks are not gonna have that deep root, but not having a balanced system can lead to dysregulation over time. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. each person has a unique balance, but <laughs> in general. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Thank you so much for your time and mm -hmm. it was great to you. Thanks for coming. Awesome. Um, we've got some some conversation going on in the chat over here. Um, just wondering if you guys wanted to open the, open this up and, and speak, um, or if you're okay staying on the chat for yeah, now. So Claudia, is it? Have you come across any mentions of using psychedelics to treat, manage obesity, or anyone else in the meeting? I'm working with Neon Mind. Um, Okay, so I love the idea of, so she said she's working with Neon Mind to help them with some validation studies regarding music and would love to hear more background if you have come across any. Um, so obesity and a lot of eating disorders are tied to dysregulation in the sense of self. So that relationship to the DMN um, and so it can sometimes be tied to comparison, but it can also be tied to like an impulse challenge, which is a lot more to do with the cingulate. And so for each individual, I need to meet them where they're at and get a sense of their narrative, personal narrative and story. And why did that nervous system lean that way? Plus we know that certain phenotypical patterns may lean more towards um, certain addictions. So whether that person's is a genetic kind of obesity or is it because of an overeating, that's also something to be distinguished. Um, and then the idea with music is, I think that the music of neurofeedback when we're using auditory feedback is going to become an art unto itself. And so it's something we are exploring with some music musicians right now on how do we start not just navigating the artistry of the feedback, but also making the feedback individualized as well. So it's an area to be explored for sure. Awesome, thank you. Cause um, I was just wondering about like how music ties into helping like the psychedelic experience. So I think I'll contact you and get in touch. Yeah, definitely. And you should look at the Wave Paths app. Um, Mendel Kalen, he's the one studying uh, this for the most part when it comes to using my, uh, music with psychedelics. And he's created an app that psychedelic therapists can utilize and you can augment and change the tone of the music as they go through the experience. It's, it's pretty cool. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So just going back up in the chat, Sal asked if we if you could explain um, expand more on machine learning that is used in the new platform. Ha, you know what is great for you, Sal, is that Alex, my CEO, is here. I don't know if it I could let him answer that question <laughs> because that's not that's not my wheelhouse. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the question, first of all, Sal. Um, I, I'd like to kind of just answer this in a high level. So, um, you, you know, quite like um, Heather's knowledge earlier of the kitchen, you know, we see machine learning as an inalienable part of this platform. And it's really a highly advanced oven or cooking tool where we can, you know, really coagulate and construct highly sophisticated models based on information that are um, that is collected, um, normalized, and, and cleansed, we can build predictive models based on, um, you know, sort of mathematical process, be it uh, supported vector machine or, or uh, random forest or neural nets, we can uh, pick out specific features or, or uh, phenotypical characteristics um, that you can observe in a waveform or in mathematical 
uh, contacts, we can uh, predict the presence of a certain phenotype, um, you know, with the presence of those um, characteristics that are matched from the input parameters. So, so it's, in a way, it's a classic machine learning paradigm where we have, um, you know, EEG and heartbeat um, or other biometric information sent in. The model itself will, will spit out a predictive score based on training material that that it's been developed with, right? And uh, you know, we either do things like classification or prediction, um, you know, based on time series um, characters. So, so I hope that answers your question. I think so. I think he dropped out on accident, but it's, this is being recorded, so we can get okay. it. Yeah, I hope he reads that after. Yeah. Um, that 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 is a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, um, we have a question from Harley. How ac how accurate are intrinsic networks like DMN on EEG compared to fMRI? So it's a good question. Uh, I don't know that I have that level or specific of an answer. I think Alex may. <laughs> I can take a crack at it. We're a good um, team I, for this reason. <laughs> <laughs> so anything that's sort of engineering and, and electrical. He handles. <laughs> And so, um, so that's a great question, um, Harley. And um, the the high level conclusion I would I would put out there is that um, EEG and fMRI are both instrumental um, tools um, to measure uh, what is happening in the brain in terms of reflecting any particular network activity, like a, like the DMN activities. Um, they're they're slightly different. You see. EEG measures the electrical impulses, therefore um, is very time sensitive. So, so EEG is great for measuring things that are happening very, very quickly in the brain. Um, while it is um, a great tool to measure things that are very precise in the, in the temporal spectrum, um, it kind of sucks in terms of spatial because you know electricity kind of flows all around and, and the skull is a great um, uh, sort of a dampener um, for those who are engineers or electrical engineers, they kind of just bounce electricity over the place. So, you know, while you can get a very good read in a time scale, it is difficult to nail down what is happening uh, in a precise little uh, uh, sort of drop pin of an area, which is where fMRI is great because it measures blood flow uh, using magnetic resonation. So it's great in terms of, um, you know, it's great in terms of spatial um, sensitivity, so you can nail something down that's happening in a, in a you know sort of millimeter. But um, um, fMRI does not have nearly the, the temporal sensitivity that EEG has because when when you require um, you know a good fMRI shot is sort of um, um, a subject to stay perfectly still and and also it um, it takes time to sort of distill that image. It's very information dense. So while it's great you know, tracking the location of blood foam, precisely what happens is impact of a, a, a stimulus or condition, um, it, it loses that time sensitivity. So, um, you, you know, best of both worlds would be if you were to look at a combined fMRI and EEG study. But mm -hmm. um, the other differentiator I like to call out is from an engineering point of view, um, you know, fMRI uh, usually are much, much larger and more expensive. So it's hard to, you know, I'm not aware of one single fMRI device that's truly mobile and clinical grade, right? So, um, you know, for any kind Kind of uh, event-based studies like um, like neuromeditation, neurofeedback, EEG would be the better tool um, because you don't you're not really interested in pinpointing that to a millimeter uh, a precision um, you know sort of uh, uh, in a clinical or surgical manner uh, so long as you're not trying to touch the, the area that's an impact or or do some sort of precision-based surgery that's where you would require fMRI to come in but um, EEG is more um, um, uh, viable, I think, accessible and topical, right? So I, I hope I, I answered your question there. Um, uh, Danny, did you have a question as well? Um, yeah, um, it kind of has to do with machine learning in a way, I guess, too. Like I've, I've uh, looked at some papers that were um, trying to detect patterns that correlate with, I guess, like with uh, valence and arousal. So basically, um trying to detect patterns that correlate with emotion like do you think that is that useful because you guys are talking about phenotypes like it is it like how does that come into play or is it even do you think it makes sense i suppose well i, I think that's a better question for heather because she's the clinician here okay so looking at states of emotion is something that you know the tool this is why it's a relational technology so it's a human to computer to human device. We in no way, shape or form are ever planning to replace the clinician. 
This is a supportive tool. And I think that we are going down, you know, the Borg path if we think we're going to be able to really figure out that answer only using technology. What, what will happen is my client is training, I'm watching their brain, I see a, a peak of arousal, which is more like a beta frequency, for example, like they, something happened. And so then I say, what happened there? And that is usually so incredibly productive because my client feels seen, right? These events that are going on in their head that just randomly happen all the time. I'm like, oh, I noticed a shift. And I'm like, well, how did you notice that? I'm like, well, there's a sense your nervous system adjusted some way, shape or form. And then we get into a conversation of how did that feel? What was the thought? And then we can start rebuilding our relationship with that habitual pattern in their nervous system that maybe is just automatic at this point. But as we start breaking it down, so in some ways we look at it, we call it like parts work. What I like about the technology is it can start highlighting the edges of the parts, which otherwise are kind of like shattered pieces of glass that people keep stepping on and cutting their feet. And they're like, I don't know why I keep doing this. I'm like, well, let's understand why, why did it break in the first place? Where are the pieces? How do we come to understand them? And then how do we come to put them back in a way where they're no longer harming you? because your nervous system is trying to speak to you in some way, shape or form. And it's usually we get into this combative relationship with the nervous system because just there wasn't enough care or know-how to make sense of it before then. So it's, it's a, a mediator as opposed to, it's gonna give you the answer. Yeah, that, that's great, Heather. If I can just have one quick analogy and you know, for those who really miss flies, uh, flying, uh, sorry, <laughs> fly. Uh, which is probably about everyone on this call now. Um, the, the analogy is that these technology things that we're building are like the, the scanners that you put your luggage through. Um, you can't automatically just you know fault somebody for carrying something that they're not supposed to just because the scanner shows a certain way. You still have to have a human that's highly trained on the other end of the scanner to make that judgment call, right? So our system in a way is sort of like, you know, it's kind of not unlike the, the kitchen analogy, but in this analogy, the scanner is really a tool that basically gives you a probabilistic score or, or best guess, if you may, and the human at the end of the day will still apply the context and make the call, right? So that, that's kind of how we see it. Thank you. Does anyone have any other questions, anything they'd like to be discussed a little bit further. Um, this will also be recorded, so you can come and listen back to any of this as well. But just before we wrap up, did anyone want to share anything or ask anything? Um, I just had like a, a general question. You kind of touched on this already, but for, for anybody that wants to pursue a career in neural feedback, um, do you have any advice for, yeah, I guess maybe people that are undergrad or um, people in general? Yeah. So that's part of what we're hoping to do is to, you know, you know, sign up for our newsletter because we are trying to work within the neurofeedback community to uh, create like a mycelium web of connection that makes it easier for those wanting to enter into this field to find the teachers or the chefs and the lineages and to understand the differences between the lineages and like, where do you wanna do your training? Because it's been a wild west ride <laughs> for me. And I, I was really lucky that, you know, because I did research in my master's, I was introduced to the community and introduced to the mentors. But traditionally one place that they can go is the BCIA. So the, um, I don't remember what that standing for, hold on. <laughs> and I'll get back. I'll send the link here. So BIOS Certification International Alliance. And you need to, it's, it's kind of the regulatory body that exists in the neurofeedback community. Um, oops, let me put it for everyone. So you can find clinicians through here. You can find trainings through here. You can train as a neurofeedback therapist in which you actually need to have a clinical degree of some sort and a license. But if you wanna be an EEG tech, you could work under someone like me. So if I, at some point have a bunch of clients and I then wanna refer them out to techs who know how to work with the brainwaves and they're just basically helping them with the training and then they come back to me, the therapeutic overlay, 
that's one place where you could look for that. The Neuromeditation Institute is another place that you could go. And I think just stay in touch with our platform because that's something that we're going to be building out because this is still, it's got a long history, but finding it is tricky. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here and providing some information in this area of expertise of yours. Um, thank you as well to Alex for eliminating um, some important things. <laughs> yeah. And thank I you be here. for showing up um, and listening and expanding your mind with this, this new information. This is extraordinary and we're really grateful that we can have these discussions and expand our minds with this fascinating new field. Thanks for having me. It was really great to meet all you guys. And if there's any lingering questions, it's just heather at divergencenero.com. Awesome. Thank you so much, Heather. It's been Thank a you. Bye. Thanks, everyone.